right, today we're going to talk about percussion accessories. Um, there's a misconception that these are very easy instruments to play, and I'm actually going to confess they are. They're easy to play very poorly. Anyone can play. <laughs> to play them musically, to take a bent piece of metal and make music, and to make music with some of these sounds is very difficult. So I'm going to talk a little bit, I'm hoping I won't talk too much, I hope some of you might have questions and I'd like a couple to come up and play to see if I can help them develop some techniques. So uh, before we go any further, I'd like to demonstrate some difficulty. So a passage that's difficult from España by Chabriel. There's a very difficult tambourine part and a difficult triangle part. And they're very quick, so I, I like to just play it. and skill. Now the triangle also has a difficult passage. Again, I'll play the triangle part for you. accessories important. They add unique sound textures to band, orchestra, and other ensembles. Being a member of a percussion section requires playing accessories. Four or five person percussion section, you're playing accessories a lot of the time. A well-rounded percussionist will be a better musician and more versatile performer. Why are percussion accessories ignored? Well, the common reasons many young percussionists view them as easy to play and don't take them seriously. Band directors often assign accessory parts to the weaker players, which drives me nuts. Many band directors have little knowledge or appreciation of percussion accessories and lack of sufficient private lesson time. If you have an hour lesson, you're lucky to have an hour lesson a week, there's so much marimba, mm -hmm. timpani, sandra, and mump. There's just not time. There's just not time. So it's a fact of life. What are the percussion accessories? They are typically the smaller handheld instruments with complement drums and keyboards. Some of the accessories include cymbals, tambourine, triangle, wood block, castanets, sleigh bells, plus many others. So you might ask, how can I learn to play percussion accessories? You need to familiarize, familiarize yourself with the accessory instruments, understand the technique required to play a particular accessory because they're very different and spend a minimal amount of time practicing. So the big question is, what does that mean? How much practice time is needed? My rule is five to 10 minutes, three times a week. It's quite easy. I used to use intermission at rehearsals. I used to rehearse three times a week for many years, 20 minute intermission, and I'd take five or 10 minutes of that and practice either triangle or tambourine or Castanets, whatever uh, technique was required for that week. Now, before we go any further, I have a very, very important tambourine. <laughs> You need a tambourine with a head with good jingles. So a professional can execute tambourine's part on that. I hate it when I go to a band room and see that is this dual tambourine. It's a different type of instrument. So let's talk about basics. I prefer to hold the tambourine in a non-dominant hand. I'm a righty, so I hold it in my left hand because I'm going to do most of my a single articulation playing with my right. 
I use a firm yet flexible grip. What does that mean? It means that the tambourine has to move because the jingles have to move. If you're strangling this, you're going to choke the sound. I like to use a 45 degree angle. I find that gives me a nice blend between the jingles and the head sound. It's a great all-purpose uh, position to be in. And the center line with the arm has to be the arm has to be positioned near the center of the camera. If you hold it like that, when you roll, it's not going to be even or like that. It's got to be centered along an axis, so it's even. Now the last one is what's the matter you? And that's not where I went to graduate school. Well, no, um, imagine you're in Italy and you do something stupid. And say what's the matter you? This is the this is the grip. This is it. Not this. Why? Flams. Flams. I very rarely use a fist. Uh, I use. I take out my aggression in other ways. Um, I I use my fingers put together, pinched into a uh, one contact area, and sometimes I'll pull some of them off to lighten the beat a little bit. So with the tambourine, we have to play roles like uh, like snare drum and timpani. There's really two types of roles. Shake rolls and finger rolls. With a shake roll, the biggest mistake people make is they're really shaking it. And I have a very special technique that I teach my students in Boston. I teach this only in January. I tell them to bring a bathing suit to the lesson. I change it to the bathing suit. I walk them outside. It's about 20 degrees. And I hand them a tambourine. And I say, let me see you do a shake roll. <laughs> That's it. It's a small motion. It's not a big motion. We don't want articulation. Now, recently, I've seen uh, other types of rolls. And I kind of like that. It gives a nice uh, sonority. But you always have to be in control of the instrument while allowing it to move and vibrate. Now, the finger roll or the friction roll goes around the circumference of the tambourine. So who here, would somebody like to come up, somebody who can't do this? This one is, I like to use a little beeswax or something, because it's friction that's, that's making the tambourine move. What's your name? Chris. Chris, hi. Welcome. So, uh, why don't you hold it? Are you right-handed or left-handed? Right-handed. Okay, so hold it in your left hand. Now show me what you would normally try and do. I thought you couldn't do it. <laughs> No, I said you could. Oh, I'm sorry. Get out of here. Does anybody want to come up? Yeah, come on up. So basically, things to think about. You're going along the circumference. You don't want your thumb turning sideways. You're pointing in the direction of the motion. And I like to hold the tambourine vertically for those rolls, for the most part, because the jingles have to shimmy back and forth between the slots of edges of the thing. What's your name? Eunice. Eunice. Eunice? Okay. Well, nice to see you. Okay. Show me. Stand this way. Now, have you tried it before to do it? Yeah. Okay. Let me see what you... Okay. That's good. Perfect. I like well, here's a couple things to help. You don't want to push hard into the head. Think about this, we're at a lake, and you have a rock, and we're skimming the rocks along the lake. Would you use a heavy rock? No, no, we use a light rock. So you don't want to use a heavy rock. This is the lake, and we're skimming. And keep your motions as steady as possible. Try that again. You're pushing way too hard, way too hard. Try it again. A little light, lighter, lighter, lighter. It's okay, it's okay. <laughs> It's okay. Oh, God. <laughs> no, it's, now you're sorry it came up, right? <laughs> it's still late. No. Don't push so hard. Here, let me help you here. Just hold that. Hold that back. You feel that? And do this. You mind licking your thumb? I'm not going to figure it out. Try, <laughs> try it again. Go a little faster, lighter. There you go. A little faster, lighter. Yeah. If you practice that for five minutes, you'll get it down. It's just a matter of once you get the feel, it's like riding a bicycle.
Okay, thank you. Thank you for coming out. Right you know, I noticed a lot of people are doing those finger rolls with their middle finger. I usually, my thumb, I'm old school with the thumb. Occasionally, if it's something that soft, I'll use that. But the question I'm going to ask you is, how do we determine whether we're playing a shake roll or a finger roll? What, what is the, anybody want to tell me what the determining factor is? If there is one? Yes. Dynamic? Yeah, you know, you could play a shake roll for the loud and a finger roll for the soft, but I can play a shake roll pretty soft. So for me, that's not the overriding criteria. Yes? Uh, what's coming next? What's before it? Can you switch? That, that comes into play for sure, for sure. Um, who else wants to? No, who said note value? Yeah, that's correct. So I like to think of it, and there's no right or wrong. Let's get that out of the way. I, for what works for me is I think of the shake rolls for the longer rolls, typically, and the short rolls for the fingers. So if I'm thinking about snare drum rudiments, five stroke, seven, and nine, and I run out of real estate there. <laughs> now somebody asked me a while back, what about the figure eight, you know, the continuous figure eight roll? I used to live a mile from Nancy Kerrigan, the epic skater, and she is the only one I have ever known who could do a figure eight consistently. <laughs> it doesn't work in bringing you, I never let anyone that can consistently do that. Now that's, a, that's one place to start. However, it's not always applicable. So for me, I always like to try it different ways to see what suits the excerpt of the piece I'm playing. So as an example is the Carnival Overture by Dvorak. In this particular excerpt, I use, um, both a shake roll and a, and a finger roll. Hopefully my finger roll will work today. Okay. to help myself. It's playing at a high level is very hard consistently. So if I can do something that helps me be consistent, I will use that technique. So at the end of the uh, Nutcracker, there's a Nutcracker Ballet, there's a, a movement, the Arabic dance, and it ends with very soft, triple piano tambourine to nothing. And it's always tricky. So what I like to do is I just pretend I'm holding a basketball and just place the tambourine on top. I could play nice and soft that way. Red, hold it. It's much harder for me that way. And I, I keep it flat. So the staccato? I keep it flat. And the other technique I like to use is a fist knee technique. And that's a technique I use at the beginning. I'll be using it again. It's a technique that allows us to play very fast articulations loudly because, you know, we're handicapped. We only have one meter. So the, the fist knee technique, the knee becomes the second fist, right? So I like to do an exercise to um, always warm up, and I'll do it uh, eight, uh, four notes, three, eight, seven, fifteen. And you know, 
goes to tambourine, I'm using the arm, not the wrist, because I don't want to change the angle on it because it changes the sound. Um, would somebody like some help learning how to do that? Also, you need to elevate your knee on a chair or this fancy overpriced little gadget here. <laughs> Lance, nice to meet you. Okay, let me give you the tambourine. Okay, so have you tried doing this at all? Okay, are you right handed or left handed? Okay, so hold it in the left hand this way. Lance, put your foot up there. No, the other one. Yeah, so it's important you put the opposite gotcha. knee. Now imagine I take a drill, Lance, and I'm drilling into your kneecap, and you're screaming, and I put a triangle beat right in there. <laughs> right? Forget about the board. And this is going up and down like this on that, on that beater. You're not tilting it, right? Yeah. And so you're up here with your other hand. You can use a fist, but bend it down. And now you're going to go fist, knee, fist. So just do eight, uh, do chord notes. One, two, three, four. Fist, knee. Now keep going, and I want it to work to get it to sound even. Don't worry about rebounding it so much. some degree of proficiency before they have to. So if you just think five, ten minutes a couple times a week, it, you'll, it will work out very well for you. Now, let's talk a little bit about tri triangle, which I think, there was an old uh, comic, Ronnie Dangerfield, his line was, I, I don't get no respect. Well, the triangle gets no respect, <laughs> and it really bothers me. Um, the question is, what should a triangle sound like? Is it a bell sound, like a bell, or a cymbal? And this is a discussion that's been going on for many years. My philosophy is, it is an extension of a symbol, just higher. It should have plenty of overtones, and it shouldn't sound pitched like a bell. Um, I don't want it to sound focused, so here's a, here's a bell-like sound. That has a pitch. This is a sound with overtones. Now, it doesn't sound as pretty we're sitting in this room, nothing else is going on. But if we were in the back of an ensemble and they're playing a chord, unless the chord is the same pitch as that, it's gonna sound awful. This has an overtone series, like a cymbal, that blends with whatever it's accompanying. Now, if you think about it, the triangle's just a big tuning fork, right? It's got two tines, like a tuning fork. We hit the tuning fork for A, or whatever note you're tuning to, B flat. So, if you strike the triangle at a 45 degree angle like this, guess what? The two ends, the two tines are going to vibrate uh, in this mode, in and out, and that will sound very pitched. To get the, the really nice sound with overtones, lush with all kinds of harmonics, I'm actually pushing away the open leg. So instead of the tines doing this, they're vibrating in a different mode, out of sync, and that allows a lot of the overtones to come through. So I'm going to try something to see, let me see if I can actually mute some to bring out the over, some of the overtones in this instrument. Yeah, so it's got a lot of sounds. Now, just quickly, for those of you who aren't really sure what overtones are, every musical sound, every sound has a fundamental frequency, let's call it A440, and a series of other tones that are produced called overtones or harmonics. 
The harmonics are what determine the sound color, or the, what we call the timbre. So in other words, in Boston, the oboe sounds the A. We won't get into what pitch that really is, because it's 442. That's, a, that's another lecture. And, um, and then the orchestra tunes to it. But So the oboe sounds the A. I can, that's an oboe. Then the flute plays. That's a flute. But they're both playing the same note, 442. It is a harmonics in the structure that says, it's a, it's a identifying, like a fingerprint. Oh, that tells me, the harmonics are telling me that's the flute. The harmonics tell me that's the, that's the clarinet, uh, the oboe. Now symbols, if you were to look at a symbol waveform on an oscilloscope, it looks chaotic. So with instruments of indefinite pitch, with symbols, triangles, tambourine, it, they do have fundamental frequencies, but the ratio of harmonics to fundamental is so great that the human ear can't find can't find the fundamental, and that's what we want. It's kind of it's kind of like a game. So I talk about overtones, overtones, overtones. The other thing about a triangle is the suspension is so important. They're very thin, and you don't want to dampen this. I have something from my closet of shame that I find, this is something I found in a bathroom. Now first of all, I think it's a medieval torture device because I can hardly open it. And this thing, even on a good triangle, will dampen it. Not to mention it's spinning around, that's really nice. Well, the high end is gone. The other thing is, is not to do this if you can help it. Don't play it on a stand because listen to this. Here, some of the vibrations are getting sucked up by the stand, and I don't want that. Now, so triangles come in different materials, different sizes. There's no right or wrong. It's like ice cream. You know, pick a flavor that works for you. But what I will say is if you're not sure and you want to get one triangle size, I would go with a six inch because it's small enough to be delicate. It has enough body to really, to really sound good in a big group. Now, the roll on the triangle is typically played in the inner corner, but once again, I don't want to play it like this. That's not producing overtones. I'm moving it in and out, so I'm hitting it on an angle to produce the overtones. And by changing that angle, I can get very soft. I always grip my triangle beater the way I would in a French Tiffany grip, because I just it's very convenient for me. And I play on that bottom, usually on the bottom open end. Um, there is usually a sweet spot on all triangles where it sounds really particularly nice. Don't be shy about finding a sweet spot. And on my personal triangles, this is one I usually put a little pencil mark, because I, you know, sometimes I, I don't have time to really figure it out, so I know it's a sweet spot. Listen to the change. I like it somewhere in there. And it's just a matter of taste. Just a matter of taste. Now the triangle, a good triangle will ring a very long time. So one reason to hold it with a clip is so you have your fingers free to muffle it. You know, we all know that classical composers were very good at notating when, a, when percussionists should hit something. Mm -hmm. They were terrible at letting you know how long it should ring. They usually ignored it. So usually half the time the parts, the markings are wrong. The note length is wrong. You have to use your judgment and listen. Typically with these instruments, you're not playing melody. You're not, you're not a soloist. Um, you're, you're adding sound color to to other things going on. So I always like to think, who am I blending with? And I'll follow their articulation and follow their dynamic uh, contour. Once again, producing overtone, strike the open leg, uh, 45 degree angle, and use angled rolls. Finger dampening, we just talked about that. The magic size six inch, the use of a good clip. If you can't use a clip, if you have to play with two beaters, which is occasionally you do, or if you're playing a show and you can't pick up a triangle, use some device that holds, that's meant to hold a triangle. Don't 
try not to play it on a clip on a stand, because the stand really makes it sound bad. Spencer, excellent. Take this one, Spencer. Okay. Are you right-handed or left-handed? Right-handed. Okay. So I'm going to give you a meter here. So what we want to do, we always want to hold a clip like that with a finger on top. Some people like two fingers. I, I like one. And do this. See, that's your muffling, right? So hold it up and give me a few repetitive quarter notes at different dynamics. Start like piano and get the forte. Good. One thing, Spencer, you're doing, which I really like, he's, Spencer's playing on the end of the beater. That, that, hear that change in sound? Much more overtone at the end. I don't know why, but it just is. And you did that naturally. Let me see you try a roll. Yeah, that's good. Pull, pull the triangle beater out a little bit. Angle down now. Angle it down. All the way down here? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's where really soft. Now, as you get louder, angle it up. That's the way to change dynamic. Oh, the angle. The angle changes dynamic, not going into the corner. The corners are too big to really get this. Because if you try... thing I'd like you to try. Imagine we're playing eighth notes. We're striking it on the beat and the and we're going to muffle so. Make sure the muffling is on the offbeat exactly. Okay. Right, good. Now we would never muffle, a, I would never muffle a triangle unless it was a subito cutoff. We have different shades. You could decide how to taper that note off, and that you'll have to use your ears to know what you're playing. Like in that, in that, in that Espana, the the eighth notes are dotted. It's the kind of so. Um, I use mm. So I'm, I was muffling it a little bit on the on the end just to reset it. And it's hard to it's, it's like patting your head and doing this. Yeah, right. But five minutes of practice. It's really going to come a lot more naturally. Very good, Spencer. Thank you very much. Hey, for those of you that I've called up, please come to the Grover booth later, and I have something for you. Okay? It's a new Tesla. All right. <laughs> um, um, who has questions? Because um, I'm here for you, and I, I don't want to just keep talking things I think you should hear. Yes, sir. What about the different materials for the triangle beater? There's brass. Yes, yes, the different materials for the triangle beaters. Um, yes, there's brass. I'll be very honest with you. If you give me a brass beater the same size, and I, it, 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 the difference is almost negligible. Um, with Pete, some people like beaters with the beater faces bigger, and we and we make them at Grover. Um, I I like these straight, the, just standard straight beaters. I always have a set of five or six on hand because, of course, if I have a really soft thing, I'm not going to use a heavy beater. Like I say, I want to help myself. You know, it was very funny. One time, uh, a conductor asked me, uh, I, was, I was using a triangle and he didn't like it. He says, do you have another triangle? And I said, a couple of dozen. And he, he thought I was kidding. <laughs> you know, so I got the mission, I brought him to my locker and so on. Now, I talked at the, the beginning about the instruments and taking them seriously. And it's got to start with us. Because we're not going to get our colleagues in an orchestra to take us seriously until we take ourselves seriously. So I have a colleague, Joe, a wonderful violinist. I've known him for many years. We were playing a concert, and I was playing triangle. And I had eight notes in the, the piece. So he said to me, um, did you ever feel foolish standing back there playing the triangle? I, and I didn't answer that. I said, well, let me ask you, how many notes do you play tonight? He said, I don't know, thousands. I said, how many thousands? He said, at least 10,000. I said, okay, so based on what we're both making tonight, you're making about four cents a note. <laughs> I want you tonight, while we're playing, Joe, to listen, and every time you hear this, think, 
there's $50 going into Neil's bank account. <laughs> When we're done with the piece, while the conductor's taking a bow, I want you to think, who's really the fool here? <laughs> so I joke about it, but the point is, you know, these are important instruments. They, it's, it requires somebody playing them to a high degree, and while it might not be as difficult to master the triangle as a violin, you know, nobody will say that. What we do as professional percussionists, playing dozens if not a hundred instruments, with different techniques and knowing sound production and having to make choices and figure out choreography in the section. That's what's really hard. That is as hard as playing any instrument, any single instrument. So we shouldn't be fooled to think the triangle is not important because the triangle is part of this overall collection of percussion instruments that we need to master to bring uh, to a professional. Any other questions? Yes, Bob. With the good of the order, would you describe the different jingles you use how do you know, personally, which jingles you want to use for certain pieces? Shady. Which jingles? Um, once again, it's like, to me, it's like ice cream. There's no right or wrong. Right. To me, the thing that everybody ignores, and that they don't take into account, are the acoustics of the environment you're playing in. I toured for 40 years with the Boston Pops, and we played great concert halls, and we played hockey arenas. One-nighters. And I'd be in a concert hall and sounded great. The next night, I sounded horrible. I couldn't do anything, I'm in a hockey arena. So I would always try and have a couple of choices, and it's really the acoustics of the room, and sometimes the, the literature. If it's something soft, I'll grab a heat-treated tambourine with jingles that are really crinkly and crunchy. But you know, the, the environment is really the overriding thing. Um, uh, the conductor also, I, when John Williams first came to Boston, I was playing triangle. I, I like to use an eight inch, symphony hall's pretty big. And he stopped, he said, Neil, do you have a small, can you use a smaller triangle? He likes small triangles. So I asked him one day, his, fa his father was a great drummer, John Williams Sr. And his two brothers are Hollywood percussionists, so I know. I said, John, why do you always want the high triangle, the little triangle? He says, well, that's what I'm used to in the recording studios. That's what they use, because the mic picks it up so good. So of course, you know, he's the, he's the boss, whatever he wants. It wouldn't have been my choice, but I'm not there to decide, it's the conductor's choice. Um, I do want to say before I forget, you know, none of us professionals will be here if it wasn't for great teachers and mentors and friends. And I have a former teacher and mentor and friend who's here, and I, he just retired from the University of South Florida. I'd like to recognize him, Bob. Bob McCormick, would you stand up? Thank you, Bob. Very supportive when I wanted to go to Boston to study uh, with Dick Firth and help me prepare for that. Uh, any other questions? Yes. Um, I've seen a lot of uh, type of triangles that are like pretty thick, and then they yes, a, yes, the Alan Abel type triangle yeah. with his profile. So let me tell you the story of that. Alan and I were very close friends. I used his stuff; he used my stuff, and we, we were very close. I had utmost respect for him. Alan told me the story himself. That triangle he found in, a, in, in an antique store in Worcester, Massachusetts, when he joined the Philadelphia Orchestra. I did a little research, and those triangles were made in the turn of the century by a company in Worcester, Mass, called Wahlberg and Auger. They were hardware manufacturers. I have their catalogs from back then. You see all those triangles. Those triangles were steel spindles from the knitting mills in New England in the turn of the century. And near where I lived, there's big mills. It was, the, it was the fabric capital of the U.S. And they had these big knitting mills. And the spindles, when they'd wear out, they would send them and they'd heat them and bend them. And they sounded good. So that's, that's the history of that. To me, it sounds a little more pitched than I like. It's a, it's, you know, it's a different sound. And it's just preference. And I think the beauty of being percussion is, is there's no real right or wrong. We all can instill a little bit of ourselves into what we're doing. You know, I like to say, you know, I can improvise, but not with rhythms. I can improvise with choice. You know, symbols, piatti, what does that mean? It means plates. Well, 10 inch, 12 inch, 20, heavy. And this is the beauty of being a percussionist, is choosing sound colors and having palettes of colors that you can choose from in your instruments and in your techniques. Yes, who else? Yes. Um, so when you played a 
Sanyan triangle, it was incredibly consistent between the two edges. Yes. How do you develop that consistency of sound there? Well, I'll tell you, that's a really good question. Um, well, let me tell you a story of what happened last night. Uh, I was in the room practicing, and when I practice triangle, I don't practice like this. I, I do a lot of that, and try and get that to sound even. And I don't know, I was, I did something, I, I, I wanted to ask a question on the front desk at the Western, and I pushed a button and it didn't work. Well, I apparently pushed the panic button on the telephone. They came rushing up thinking I had a heart attack. So, and then knocking, Mr. Grover, are you okay? And I, I had to try and in the bathroom. And I walk over and I open the door. Yeah, I, did somebody complain? Oh no, we thought something happened. So, I, in fact, I was practicing that same excerpt um, instead of... Um, Because if the rhythm's not right, I could hear it then. So it's just a matter of practicing a lot of that. At first I was sounding like somebody, you know, like a peg leg. But so that's, 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 how, that's how that's developed. Um, other questions? Yes? Uh, personally, what do you think about rolling like sideways? Rolling sideways. Um, I'm not a fan of it like this, because to me it sounds pitch, I, I hear bell pitches, so it's the same as doing this to me. No, that's, that doesn't mean it's wrong. It's just, you know, you know, I, I'm a fan of baseball, and it always amazes me watching the great hitters. Some of them stand like this, and they have all different stances. Yet they get great results, and it's it, it's not a right or wrong way. Whatever works for you. So for me, I wouldn't choose that for that reason, because it sounds bell-like to me. Yes. That two meter, that same excerpt. Were you ever tempted to play it on a flat triangle with two beaters? I was. I was. Um, and what, what determines your? Um, I'm really kind of very old school about things. If I played it one way, I, and what determined it for me, I've noticed, and this is this is a truth that's. Not secret, but people don't talk about. When somebody comes to hear the Boston Pops and they're watching the concert, who are they looking at? They're looking at the percussion section. Because we're picking things up. You know, they're, you know, they're playing a cello in a coffin. A coffin has a dead person on the inside. Right? <laughs> so there's not a lot of movement back there. Now, yeah, the conductor's moving, but you're looking at the back. But the percussion is interesting. And it is a visual world, and this is the thing a lot of orchestras are ignoring, and they're going to be in trouble because the, what people are looking for is stimulation visually and musically. And so I found a lot of conductors listen with their eyes. If they can't, and Vic Firth taught me this. He said, hold it up. He can't see what you're doing. So when I hold it up, the conductor's looking at me. I'm looking at the conductor. They seem to be happy. Um, they're generally insecure people, so I, I, I like to look at them and smile and hold this up. And as long as the conductor's happy and that paycheck keeps coming, I'm happy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so that, that, but, but I've seen people play it like this a lot, and it sounds great. In Europe, they sit down. You know, that's a different school. They, sit, they put the snare drum on the chair, and that's that's fairly beyond what I would do. But it's it, it's great. Yeah. Yes, sir. Speaking of uh, Europe and sitting down, Berlioz Roman Carnival, Carnival calls for two tambourines. That's right. Are they supposed to be complementary or identical? Or? Well, you know, it's not specified. It's whatever you chose to do. I would, for me, always like two different tambourines that blend to give a nice, rich sound, you know, you know some type of sparkle into it. To have the same tambourine. You know, I think of things like a choir. What, what makes a choir sound so good? The individual voices are all a little different in timbre or tone color, but they blend together. It's nice. If you had the same person cloned and they sang, it would sound very thin um, in as far as sound texture. So it's the blending of the overtones and the blending of the sound color that really gives it a nice rich sound. So there's an opportunity for really to, to show off doing that. Yeah, that's a cool part. Well, Berlioz, I think, was a percussionist, or at least played some percussion. Yeah. Yes? I have two questions. First, how do you can't always rest, or do you just learn the piece so well you don't... 
Okay? If your counting rests in a major symphony orchestra, you should not be there. I mean, you know, I, I learn everything cold. I never risked it. I, I said, you know, unless I could play this excerpt with a recording or on my own, I'm measuring ten times, ten times consecutively, I'm not ready to go play. Um, you know, it's, it's, more, it's more difficult than opera, where it says, tacit, until, bang! You know, so I, when I play operas, a lot of repertoire I didn't know. I'd learn it, I'd study with a score, and, uh, you know, I felt, always felt an obligation to know the piece cold before the first rehearsal. All right, and then second question. For those of us with bucket lists, for those of us with bucket lists, bucket list. of going to all the great concert halls right. in America or yeah. the world, can okay. you name a few that we should not miss? Boston Symphony Hall, I think I'm biased. <laughs> has the best acoustics in the world. Carnegie Hall, of course. Um, San Francisco, Chicago. Um, I haven't been to the new hall in New York yet. I haven't heard that. Carnegie, I gotta say that. Yeah, I really like in Europe the halls where people can sit behind the percussion, although I can get in a lot of trouble because, you know, sometimes I'm back there kind of snoozing a little bit. <laughs> with, with pops, it's not so much because we're running around. But, um, any of those halls with the big orchestras typically are pretty good. I mean, there's a lot of really good little concert halls, too. Um, one of my favorite, if I could just say one of my favorite venues of all time is Red Rocks in Colorado. Playing up in the mountains there. Uh, we were there on tour with John Williams, and we were playing, there was a movie, The Witches of Eastwick, that he wrote the music for, with Jack Nicholson. And I was playing Thunder Sheets, and, and we started playing out at this amphitheater, and there was heat lightning all around. It, it was unbelievable. It was magical. Uh, yeah, I mean, those are some of them. And in Europe, there's so many, I can't, I can't even recall. Japan has some really, Suntory Hall in Japan is fantastic. And, uh, yes? What happens when you move the flag before it stops ringing? What happens when you... You lower it before it stops ringing. Well, you, you may hear a little phase shift. Like that? Yeah, I usually hold it up until it's not ringing it and then put it down. Yeah, and what I don't like, I see a lot of this artificial vibrato. It's not vibrato, vibrato is a change in frequency, a trim, that's more, that's really a tremolo. They call it vibrato, but it's not. Um, I'd like to uh, wind up today um, Playing a little something from the Nutcracker Ballet, the Trey Pack tambourine part, which is a lot of fun using the Fisney um, um, technique. And um, I do want a, a, a shameless plug that I've written a book uh, about uh, uh, the art of tambourine triangle playing with Gar Whaley. Uh, that's available in Meredith Music and my Four Mallet Primer. So I hope you've enjoyed it today. And let me play the um, a little bit of the Nutcracker here. <laughs> Thank you.